Warfare is changing fast, and in the 2020s, no change has been as important or as widespread as the rise of drone warfare. Drones were, of course, part of warfare long before this decade, but drone warfare is changing, and it's changing everything. From handheld quadcopters that can provide real-time intelligence to small units on the ground, to legions of kamikaze drones that can fly hundreds or even thousands of kilometers before detonating, to cheap, crowdfunded drones, even at sea, that can turn formidable modern warships into unintentional submarines, drones have become nothing short of a modern warfare revolution. Modern militaries can't stop them, they can't afford to lose the expensive and highly valuable hardware that an off-the-shelf drone can destroy in seconds, and they are entirely unprepared to deal with the ways that drones will evolve in the years to come. But the potential for technology to rapidly change the modern battlefield is a sword that cuts two ways, and right now, as the drone revolution is still just getting started, there are technologies in development that will one day stop those drones in their tracks. And of all those technologies, all those new programs and systems, none have the potential of Leonidas. A high-powered energy weapon unlike anything the world has ever seen, Leonidas will soon be in the full employ of the US military, and when it arrives, it'll provide nothing short of a real-life force field. If the drone revolution has put the world in check, then Leonidas may become a sudden checkmate from the opposing side. But that's if this technology works, and if it can catch up to the drone revolution before the revolution enters its next stage. Consumer drones have become a major problem for global militaries in the span of the last two to three years, but their combat potential has been a matter of discussion for about a decade now. Starting with the wars of the 2010s, particularly across the Middle East in the bloody cascade of violence that followed the Arab Spring, insurgencies, terror organizations, and rebel groups started using the drones rather quickly as soon as they could be bought off of shelves. They were easy for a group's foreign supporters to purchase from abroad and send as a direct donation, and at times they could be picked up in country as well. As early as 2013, the Hezbollah organization in Lebanon worked out that they could drop grenades from consumer grade drones, and although it was expensive for groups, to spend time and money modifying the drones to carry weapons that was still a hell of a lot less expensive than finding manned aircraft or sophisticated UAVs. By 2015, the Islamic State was using drones in Syria. By 2017, in Mosul, the group had made the little things into a menace for their adversaries. Central and South American cartels started to use them for reconnaissance and narcotic smuggling, and in 2018, Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro came under attack by a pair of commercial drones in an assassination attempt. All the way back then, global media was already picking up on the trend and weighing in, with one particular hot-button issue being the US military's attempts to experiment with them. Those attempts were halted due to cybersecurity risks, but by 2017, analysts were weighing in on both sides of the issue, with many arguing that if drones were ignored, then they'd only become a bigger problem. National security outlet Defense One published an article in that same year titled I Could Kill You With a Consumer Drone, citing private research from the previous year that showed a rapid increase in the use of drones in combat zones by terrorist insurgencies. But in a newly emerging situation that saw much of the world left oblivious and elicited little more than a detached sense of curiosity from most people who knew of it, the quiet emergence of consumer drone warfare appeared to a select few to be an opportunity. The few in question uh, would found a company called Epirus, named in homage to an ancient Greek state that rose to prominence in the 270s BCE. Today, Epirus refers to itself as a so-called Neo-Prime, an organization that works to quote, innovate, build, and deliver ahead of the need, in response to the challenges of modern asymmetric warfare. But in the months after it was founded in 2018, the startup was quietly bringing together people from across the American defense and tech world who knew enough to see where this new trend toward drone warfare was headed. The US military hadn't issued any calls yet for a system that could nullify the threat that cheap aerial drones posed, or at least they hadn't issued any calls publicly. But as soon as those same drones were turned against American forces, the Pentagon would undoubtedly realize the urgency of procuring such a device, and when they did, Epic intended to have an answer already waiting. The answer they ultimately built? Well, that goes by the name Leonidas, honoring another figure of ancient Greek history, Leonidas of Epirus, the tutor to Alexander the Great. 
Unveiled in 2020, the Leonidas system was the first and most promising answer that the United States had, either public or private, to neutralize the threat of aerial drones, and very quickly the Pentagon showed interest. By 2021, the General Dynamics Corporation was working with Epirus to make the Leonidas weapon into a mobile system. A few months later, it was modified to fly in combat, and by the first weeks of 2023, Epirus was on the hook to get several prototypes to the US military as quickly as possible. It was a remarkably rushed process, atypical for a slow and journeying military-industrial complex that prefers to contract to well-established partners. But as predicted, the Leonidas system has shown up in a moment when the Department of Defense was recognizing a critical need. And as promised, the technology they provided was proven capable just in time to address the problem America barely knew it had. Although the name Leonidas honors a historical figure from ancient Epirus, perhaps the best way to explain the Leonidas system is to draw on another famous Greek historical figure of the same name, Leonidas I, ancient king of Sparta. Leonidas I and his Spartan warriors gained victory in battle by using their shields as weapons, for defense, absolutely, but also as a powerful means to gain an advantage in counterattack. The tactical philosophy behind the modern-day Leonidas system is much the same. It uses a directed energy weapon rather than an interceptor system to take out incoming threats. But rather than being a point-and-shoot offensive weapon, Leonidas is meant to provide defensive area coverage, creating less a contiguous force field in the surrounding area and more an area of denial where no unfriendly drone system can operate. The core of the Leonidas system is its use of high-power microwave energy fired in beams that create an electromagnetic pulse, or EMP. EMPs are nothing new in modern warfare, and their effects are well known, primarily their ability to disable electronic systems. But rather than, say, the natural EMPs that come from lightning strikes or the uncontrolled EMPs that result from the detonation of nuclear weapons, the EMPs that come from the Leonidas system are able to be channeled precisely. Cutting in a wide beam, they can fry anything in their path, neutralizing, say, an oncoming drone swarm all at once. Or they can focus on precise, individual targets, sniping drones out of the sky one by one as soon as they violate a given perimeter. That is a massive improvement over any laser-based system which would offer only the capability to fire against a single target at a time. Using specialized transistors rather than traditional magnetrons to generate its microwave beam, Leonidas is considered more compact than would otherwise be expected for a weapon of this kind, and at a relatively low cost of energy expenditure, it can focus a beam for a relatively long duration of time or fire off shots in rapid succession. Relying on a digitally beam-formed antenna, that beam is kept tight and highly precise such that it's unlikely that nearby friendly drones will be impacted when the beam is targeted against a single foe. Leonidas can fire very rapidly without overheating, and its effect on a target is near instantaneous rather than needing to train the beam on the target for any length of time. It doesn't require reloading, and its voltage is low enough that humans nearby aren't in danger from its emissions. It's efficient, it's easily transported, and by all indications, it's highly effective against the consumer-grade drone technology that the US military is so worried about. Any drone of that sort that comes into Leonidas's protective bubble will be fried, regardless of the specific internal electronics that it features. And the positives to the Leonidas system go well beyond just that. Initially envisioned as a towed trailer, Leonidas now has been added to the Striker, an eight-wheeled armored fighting vehicle that's been in America's military employ since 2002. The Striker is well armored, it's armed for its own defense, and it can drive under its own power at speeds of up to 60 miles per hour, nearly 100 kilometers per hour, while requiring minimal crew to operate. The software Leonidas carries offers a range of benefits, but most important of all, it's able to distinguish between friend and foe. That means that rather than simply creating an indiscriminate anti-drone force field, it creates a safe zone for friendly drones to operate while adversary devices have little hope of survival. Not only that, but the friend or foe system can be programmed to fit a given situation, enforcing, say, a no-fly zone or ignoring adversaries outside of a certain critical zone. The system has been adapted into an aerial attachment pod, giving it the option to be fitted onto a heavy-lift drone of its own and defend in mid-air. It's also in the process of being miniaturized and can at this stage be crammed into the back of a pickup truck without too much trouble. The technology is ruggedized, meaning that it can take a beating and continue to function, while the Leonidas pod is adapted to integrate with all manner of existing UAVs and could probably be grafted onto manned aircraft as well. And because Leonidas targets the electronic systems of a drone directly, rather than simply cutting it off from radio operators, it's just as successful in stopping fully autonomous drones that don't require active operator control in order to function. 
Finally, Leonidas has shown that it can be useful against not only aerial drones, but sea drones. And at the time of writing, tests have already demonstrated that it can disable a sea vessel's outboard motor in addition to basically any other sort of electronics that an operator could point it at. Perhaps most important out of any of its design elements is the focus on keeping the Leonidas system modular and easily adaptable. This is a feature of many modern US military technologies, especially ones that rely on software to function. After all, America would rather avoid the problems it's dealing with in, say, its F-22 Raptor, a highly sophisticated aircraft that still runs on software that was up to date in the 1990s. Like many more modern systems, Leonidas is built in a way that should make its hardware compatible with future enhancements, and uses software systems that can have new elements grafted on or can be outright replaced or overwritten as necessary in future decades. The hope is that as new capabilities become available and as adversaries get better at dealing with Leonidas, the technology can be quickly updated and rushed back into the fight without skipping a beat. As of now, Leonidas has gone through several iterations, and while the airborne Leonidas pod is still being adapted to heavy lift drones, the ground-based version is ready for testing. In January of 2023, the US car to the Epirus Corporation a check for $66 million after it beat out six different competitors with the expectation that the check would be used to develop four prototypes as soon as possible. 14 months later, all four prototypes have been delivered, and for about half a year now, they've been in the hands of the US government. According to statements by the U.S. Army's Chief of Staff, General Randy George, some of the prototypes are now in the Middle East for real-life testing. That's a threat environment where Iran-backed militias in Syria and Iraq have launched frequent drone attacks against U.S. service members using Iranian-designed technology and even carried out an attack that killed three Americans and injured 47 in January of 2024 at an outpost called Tower 22. Although it's not entirely clear, it's likely that the Tower 22 attack was a motivating factor in seeing the Leonidas system tested in real-life conditions since the attack was carried out by a drone that was not correctly identified as an enemy and intercepted on approach by the outpost's pre-existing air defenses. As for how Leonidas is actually doing in those austere conditions, that information isn't yet publicly available. But it's got a rather beatable adversary in front of it, not in the Iran-backed militias, but in another directed energy weapon. This one, a laser system that mounts on striker vehicles for similar air defense missions. Those laser systems have run into some trouble, apparently because it's proving difficult to incorporate higher-powered lasers into rugged machines where they've got to withstand heat, wear, and tear, whereas the lower-powered lasers that do work better have really only been successful when staying in one spot. In test conditions, Leonidas has already shown that it can deal with both single drones and drone swarms, including ones, quote, utilizing a range of increasingly complex flight patterns. If it could do the same in the field, it may well become America's leading option for large-scale procurement at a moment where good anti-drone capabilities are rather urgently needed. Current plans or expectations for large-scale production and procurement are currently unknown, if they've been decided behind the scenes at all, but given how rapidly Epirus was able to provide four prototype versions of its most advanced Leonidas iteration, it stands to reason that the turn toward production may be just as efficient. When Leonidas enters military service, it'll grant the forces of the United States near full protection over enemy drones in the areas where it's deployed. It'll be able to watch over military bases like Tower 22 that was hit in January and provide constant threat detection and interception without getting in the way of friendly drone systems. It can be put into use at border regions and local checkpoints, providing valuable overwatch for troops at fixed and exposed sites that are often the most vulnerable to attack. It can be stationed at critical infrastructure locations like dams, power plants, and more, potentially not just in military operations abroad, but in the United States, where national security analysts have warned of domestic extremists shifting their focus toward the nation's vulnerable power grid. It can be pointed to technology other than enemy drones taking out jamming systems, enemy radar, or really anything else that could be shorted out with an EMP. And because it's grafted onto mobile platforms, currently the striker, but potentially either heavy armored vehicles or lighter and more nimble ones, Leonidas has the potential to follow troops into battle, even to the front lines. Ground-based Leonidas systems can even be paired with the Leonidas pod in the air, providing a multi-layered, integrated defensive perimeter with a greater radius and more anti-drone power to take advantage of. The United States has seen firsthand in Ukraine and elsewhere as drones have become a constant reality on all sides of a battlefield. For American soldiers to be equipped with a highly mobile system that can make enemy drones irrelevant would confer a critical advantage over just about any military in the world. 
and Leonidas's potential extends further than the borders of the United States. American allies abroad would likely be overjoyed to find such a system in their own arsenals, especially the more easterly members of the NATO alliance who expect to be on the front lines in any future conflict with a drone-reliant Russia. South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam, and other U.S. allies in the Asia-Pacific would probably be just as excited to obtain the technology, while for Israel, America's foremost ally in the Middle East, a system like Leonidas could be indispensable as a final element to complete its air defense shield over the country. Perhaps the most interesting potential customer, though, is the nation of Ukraine, where a significant proportion of experts on the current war with Russia expect that it may last for years to come. Soldiers on the ground, on both sides of the war, have frequently described it as a testbed for all manner of advanced weapons, and when it comes to advanced weapons, perhaps not a single one would be as potentially game-changing as Leonidas. If the people behind the Epirus Corporation would like to become very rich very fast, then advocating for Leonidas as a likely export product would be a fantastic place to start. That being said, it's important to recognize that even though Leonidas is a game-changer, it's not a magic bullet. The system does have its inherent limitations. For example, it's been miniaturized to a size that could fit in the back of a pickup truck, but pickup trucks can't go everywhere, and even smaller versions, the sort of thing you could fit in an oversized backpack or on the back of an all-terrain vehicle, aren't yet forthcoming. That means that in certain environments, Leonidas won't be able to deploy, at least for now. Those include truly austere frontline combat situations, especially in heavily forested areas, snowy or swampy areas, or places with difficult to navigate terrain. Unfortunately, those are some of the places where small, cheap, and highly maneuverable reconnaissance or kamikaze drones can make the biggest impact. That limitation also extends to small unit operators, especially special forces troops operating far afield in difficult environments who will be unable to take the Leonidas with them, at least in its current form. It's also got critical vulnerabilities that will need to be safeguarded against adversaries, particularly its friend or foe identification system. Learn too much about that, and an adversary could develop the means to spoof the Leonidas system with signals that its drones are friendly, when in reality, they're anything but. And although Leonidas quite clearly has the potential to turn the current drone-based order of modern combat onto its head, it is important to recognize that Leonidas, as it exists now, is just one step in a long cycle. This is how warfare goes. One side develops a certain capability, the other side figures out how to counter that capability, the other side with the capability figures out how to counter the counter, and the cycle continues from there. Leonidas is a valuable answer to the problems that today's drones pose, and it remains to be seen just how any modern-day drone could get past a weapon that fries its internal systems. But if drones can be built in a way that hardens them to EMPs or in a way that uses components that are less prone to being fried in an instant, then Leonidas in its current form won't be enough. It's on the drone engineers that seek to build those weapons to find ways through Leonidas' system. And to be clear, that process will take a while. But it'll happen, eventually, and the cycle of evolution will continue. As we mentioned before, Leonidas is built to be modular, to rapidly be updated and enhanced before being sent back into the field. And with any luck, that means that in future evolutionary cycles, a later version of the Leonidas system will still be the answer. But that remains to be seen. And it's up to the Epirus team and their allies in the Department of Defense to stay ahead of the curve as best they can. In the near term, it appears unlikely, at least from the outside, that Leonidas wouldn't enter service in a combat role sooner rather than later. The capabilities it offers are simply too good. Its design, internal contingencies, and various iterations are too well thought out, and the modularity of the entire system means that although there are no guarantees, the United States can be confident that it's purchasing a system that'll be meaningful for decades rather than just years. The US has wanted directed energy tools for a very long time, and the entire world has been trying to figure out what to do about drone technology in record time as well. The Leonidas system isn't just on the cutting edge, it is the cutting edge. And if it delivers as promised, then the system might become something of a household name in the defense world very, very soon.